Hey everybody, welcome to Reimagining the Internet. I'm Ethan Zuckerman, your host. Today I have with us uh, Sarita Schoenbeck. She's associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. She is director of the Living Online Lab, which has the wonderful acronym of LOL. And she is justly celebrated for really original and creative work on equity and justice in online spaces. Sarita, thanks thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So... This show is really an opportunity to talk with some of the big thinkers about the future of the internet, about giant underlying problems with the web that we have today. Can you talk to me right now about the problem that young people in particular are having with um, harassment and abuse online? Yeah, absolutely. It's, It's pervasive, as we all know. And what I've really been focusing on lately is the challenges of what to do about it and what to do about it in ways that recognize not all harms are the same and not all young people have the same experiences online. And so I'm really interested in in where content moderation, so I kind of use that term with all the things involved with it. And where it's working for them right now and where it's failing them right now. And so some of the arguments that that we could talk about are what are the ways that current platform governance, content moderation practices are maybe pretty dramatically failing any social media users, but certainly including young people as well. So so let's start there. I I mean, first of all, maybe with the word moderation, I'm seeing a lot of people in our field wrestle with questions of whether we should be talking about moderation or about governance. I feel like moderation is usually the appropriate term when we're talking about something being done to users rather than something being done with users. Um, So for me, there are spaces like certain subreddits that might be said to be governed, but most spaces are, are closer to being moderated. How, how do you feel like moderation is is working with or against users on some of the platforms that are most popular with your research subjects? I know that you've looked at Instagram and Twitter, and, and you may have thoughts on, on Snapchat and uh, TikTok and some of the newer platforms as well. Yeah, and this is where this, this I really love this idea that you have about reimagining, because it seems like there's a lot of areas where we might reimagine what is content moderation and are there other ways to think about maybe governance and, and other ideas. And and so in a couple of papers now, I and colleagues have made this argument that current content moderation practices, which is largely focused on removing content, so content that may violate user guidelines or community guidelines, and um, removing accounts might be temporary or permanent removal. Those are kind of the two mechanisms for moderating content. Um, we've made the argument that they, they kind of rely on these criminal justice approaches, uh, very Western punitive models that say just something bad or offensive or wrong happened, we're gonna remove it, remove the content and re- maybe remove the person as well. And that's it, that seems to be how we're governing you know billions and billions of conversations daily. And, um, and the, you know, when I talk about criminal justice, these, these mirror kind of seem to be modeled after uh, physical criminal justice, offline criminal justice models, which at least in the US are um, incarcerate people, they do it inequitably, they uh, disproportionately harm, you know, people of color, disabled people. And, and so we think, think about those models, and are they working well in other contexts, like in our in our you know, criminal justice system. It doesn't seem like they're particularly effective either at helping people to um, change or, or kind of um, be held accountable for their behavior, nor are they in any way kind of a uh, dignified or, or you know, appropriate way to treat human beings in my mind and many others, of course. Um, and so this argument is that social media governance, content moderation has adopted these models. So they they identify perpetrators and then just kind of try to remove them. And it, the reasons I think it doesn't work particularly well is that they overlook the needs and the interests of the people who are targets of harassment. So the, 
individuals or communities who experience harm are completely overlooked in content moderation processes. Um, they don't try to address the harm or kind of rehabilitate or see what happened and how, how can we help people to improve their behavior in some way or if, if that's needed. Um, they're not transparent, so you mentioned procedural justice and, and we can talk more about that. And they also perpetuate kind of, or they risk at least perpetuating inequalities. And so concerns about content moderation processes as they're enacted now, which we can also come back to, is that they may again just reinforce inequities and oppression where, again, say people of color, marginalized voices, disabled people, their content is removed um, without kind of an ability to say, hey, this, this was an unfair removal, it was a false positive and things like that. You know, it feels like there's even more parallels to the criminal justice system. One that crosses my mind is that there's basically no attempt at rehabilitation. That in theory, in criminal justice, incarceration is um, part of a process of rehabilitation and reentry into society. Um, in practice, that happens far too seldom. And in fact, a lot of um, incarceration based justice systems have, have essentially given up on uh, rehabilitation. Um, but in the same sense here, we're, we're basically saying we're going to lock you up for a short period of time or permanently, which is to say you can't be on the system anymore, but we're not considering the possibility that you're going to return to our system and perhaps engage in the same behavior, nor, as you mentioned, um, are we sort of addressing the harms that were suffered by the user who was targeted. H help me sort of think about what alternatives to this system are. What is a, a more rehabilitative justice or uh, a, a restorative justice paradigm look like when applied to content moderation on social media platforms? It's a great question, and I'm excited to talk about it. But before even kind of starting in that conversation, it's important to to talk about restorative justice or other ideas like transformative justice are really complex topics. And so I do think they actually can be translated into social media governance in interesting ways. But um, but we just need to be careful about how directly we can do it, in what ways we do it, the origins of those movements. And, and so we want to keep that in mind in these conversations. Um, that they're just there's not simple kind of implementations. Do it this way, and everything will be great. But the the alternative models um, are, and these have been proposed as alternatives to criminal justice system. A prominent one is restorative justice, as you mentioned, and and this is a let's say a set of movements. So lots of people in these movements will have different ideas about what it is and what it should look like. But it's the idea that instead of sanctioning or punishing people, which just kind of reproduces more harm or creates more um, problems, oppression, whatever. Um, we should instead try to think about models of accountability. So how do we encourage people to be accountable for harms that they perpetuate? Um, and then some kinds of restorative justice talk about mediation, for example, or maybe the offender and the you know the victim or the person who experienced harm come together with a mediator or community members in one you know I mentioned we should be careful about these models when we think about taking them from one context and translating them to another is things like these mediation models um, they've been used in kind of small local communities the origins of restorative justice have been typically credited to indigenous communities um, in Canada and the US in New Zealand as a alternative pipeline from from incarceration kind of and so whether those would work online is you know a big open question because we don't have these small local communities with shared values and shared commitments to the communities but but the idea of accountability and and not just going straight to punishing people for any possible offense which is but what happens now, I think that's compelling and there's a lot more we could do online um, to move there. I think a lens that will be hard to hard for social media companies to adopt, but that needs to be really central is one of power. And so I think that people who have been historically oppressed and marginalized in 
communities and societies in the U.S., but also in various regions around the world, need to be most centered in thinking about the design of these solutions. I think whether we kind of keep existing criminal justice models or use restorative justice models, unless they're done very carefully, they'll just perpetuate and bake in the inequities. And we already see that happening now. We could talk about the way those current practices now reinforce inequities, gender, race, and things like that, rather than fixing them. And so I think restorative justice, if it was just kind of slapped on to whatever existing processes happen, it would do the same thing as well. It doesn't just magically solve social social issues. So let's, let's unpack sort of what often ends up going on on social media right now. Um, these spaces are notoriously um, desensitizing uh, in the sense that um, people often engage in behavior online that they would be significantly less likely to engage in offline, uh, particularly around speech, since for the most part, speech is the main way we can harm each other online. Uh, But people pick fights, people are abusive to one another, people are insulting. at rates that uh, are probably higher than they would end up being in the physical world. In many cases, and in most cases, um, there's speech behavior that's outside of the lines of a site's terms of service. You can report that you are being harassed and show the example of it to the moderators of a site, and they can or cannot um, take action on you. Other people can report you as engaging in hostile behavior or speech that that sort of goes uh, beyond those lines. Um, and you may find yourself sort of subjected to, to this process of moderation as well. What, what works in that system and what doesn't work in that system? It's such a narrow set of remedies and processes. And take some examples. You know, it, it makes no sense that some 15-year-old kid who says something horribly offensive once has the same outcome as Donald Trump, for example. They're both just banned. Like, in what world is is would we say offline that these two incidences or trajectories should be kind of have the same outcome? Um, or take two people, maybe one uses really offensive language along with some really racist remark, and another person does it uses offensive language with something very anti-racist. Um, both would also be banned. And in what world would we say, hey, those should be treated similarly? Or if we're parents and we're talking to our kids about this, these are not the same things. Um, and so I think one of the things that's so constrained right now with governance is the really narrow set of remedies. And by remedies, I mean what happens when there's some violation of a guideline. If we take a harms-based approach, which aligns with these alternative justice frameworks, we can think about a much wider array of remedies. And so whether it's an apology, an expression of intent to not do that again, um, a conversation, a little educational tidbit, you know, and for all of these, they may or may not work. The idea is just let's think about a much broader way of interacting and having conversations, which which mirror what we imagine in communities. We think about healthy communities. We don't just kind of say something did some, someone did something wrong and let's remove them and done. So I take a socio-technical approach to how we think about this, which means that there's the social behavior on the site and then there's the design or the technical affordances and they shape each other. And so I think that we can still protect important principles like speech while having a whole lot of other ways of handling behavior that is offensive or concerning or harmful and also what to do about it where maybe removing the content is a last resort but it not is not necessarily the first second or third or the only route possible so there's lots of other ways of, of trying to engage with people and give them opportunities to to be more accountable before we get to that banning process. And I also think that will increase the legitimacy of banning if it's just for the more severe people who have not been receptive to changing their behavior, acknowledging harms, then yeah, I'm, I'm still okay with banning them. I haven't gone full like 
restorative justice, I guess, um, or I think there's limits where where that framework applies here. And so I think it's just both the punitive and restorative models have a role in governance, but we should expand the the repertoire and, and the kinds of remedies we might we might consider. The idea of socio-technical systems um, helps sort of us understand, I think, why these standards are applied so um, bluntly uh, and stupidly uh, in some cases. That the the fifteen year old um, venting once versus the president of the United States um, in a purely technical rules based system we consider what words are said. Um, in a socio-technical system, we consider the context. We consider the positionality of the person saying things. We consider the context. How often has this been said? Who's the audience for it? Um, and is it likely to actually incite people to violence? Has it incited people to violence? But if we're just looking at the, at the technical rule set, we start saying speech is speech and we're gonna treat it all the same way. Um, similarly, you know, what the platforms have come up with is a, is a purely technical intervention. We will block that account either for a period of time or indefinitely. Um, maybe it will cost you something depending on how much of your identity is tied up with the account. Um, but, you know, maybe it costs you nothing, particularly if you had an account that no one was following uh, and you simply go and create another one. I, I'm really interested as you start sort of expanding this repertoire. And it sounds like one of the spaces that you're most interested in is uh, apologies. Can you talk to me about what this recent paper that you've written, which looks really deeply at uh, apologies and how people feel about them? Um, what might apologies do within these systems that we're considering? Apologies can be a very important component of restorative justice frameworks and of the idea of accountability. And in one of our studies with U.S. adults, we asked about the idea of apologies. And in general, they were positive about it, um, along with ideas like banning and, and removing content. So people can have a range of preferences about what to do when they experience harassment. But we also found that some groups were opposed to apologies. For example, the transgender participants in our sample were, were less positive about apologies. And that could be because they may feel they're not genuine. It could be because the idea of an apology may suggest some private communication and DM or, and it could open them to more abuse. I'm excited about the idea of apologies because it can amend a lot of harms, you know, in an interpersonal level or, you know, governments apologize too, and that can be a really meaningful signal. But I also think that apologies, if they are forced, demanded, they can, again, exacerbate harm because we take, like, let's take the example of someone posted racist content and someone posted anti-racist content and they're both removed, asking the person who was posting anti-racist comment, maybe they're responding something that to now apologize is just a, an egregious trajectory to imagine going down. And so I think there's a lot of ways to move forward in this. One thing that I think is a really convincing argument is to say that people who are one-time offenders or rare offenders, and I'm using the word offenders, we should say people who perpetuate harmful content, if it's infrequent, it's not routine, we should give them alternative pathways to acknowledge that they messed up, they made a mistake, they can express that they don't, they'll try not to do it again. And in that case, we may not need to remove or ban them necessarily. The people who repeatedly are harmful, they may be engaged in networked behavior that is um, incredibly harmful for, for the victims or the people experiencing it, those can go straight to the punitive content. And that's something I think that companies can and should implement like now, you know, it's they know who's, who's who are repeat offenders who are likely to be engaging in, in networked harmful behavior. And they know who's probably just a one time really messed up, a per, person who messed up one time and just needs a different pathway to to reform their behavior. Increasingly, I'm 
of the opinion that moderation is the problem, that the problem isn't a problem with moderation, the problem is moderation. That moderation implies that some group of people is going to enforce a set of rules and your adherence to those rules is what matters, not your input into those rules or your discussion around those rules. To me, it feels like the healthiest communities are the ones that actually have robust conversations about what the rules should be, how we should deal with sanctioning, whether it's removal, whether it's apology, whether it's public shaming, whether it's any number of other things, the people sort of involved with it. So for me, the experiments I'm really interested in taking on are, can we build small communities that are operating around governance rather than around moderation. What are some of the experiments that you want to do in this space? What are the experiments you that would really get you closest to sort of answering your questions about what's wrong with moderation and, and what models that are closer to restorative justice might work in online spaces? Good question. And I love the, or I appreciate the shared concerns about content moderation and what it gets us and, and what it doesn't. I would love to see an ability to more easily move between sort of controlled, maybe lab studies, survey studies, where you can know about the people you're running the studies with. You can look for certain outcomes. For example, with you know some of the surveys I've been doing lately, we can ask people, tell me about yourself. What's your gender? What's erase other things and look at their preferences so that we can catch problems where we might say, on average, people like apologies, but they're really harmful for some groups. And I'd love to be able to move more seamlessly or um, transition from those kinds of studies to the field experiments, the online studies where concern would be you might see a really nice result, but you don't know if it's harming some groups in the process, even while it looks good for the site overall or whatever and be able to kind of move between those two. So maybe you have pools of people online where you know more about them. You can look for what safeguards are in place to make sure those who may be most harmed can be especially attended to and protected. And so as soon as we realize, hey, these measures look really good overall, but these groups, they're not working for it all. We need to stop this. And, and we need some kinds of accountability, auditing, independence, I think, because it companies may not have much incentive to stop something that works for most people, even if it harms some people more. Some of the also powerful lessons are about different countries' value systems. So Jillian York has written about this. Um, there's a variety of colleagues. Amna Batul is a PhD student who's looking at women's experiences of gender-based violence in Pakistan. And a country like Pakistan, for example, social media is such a profound kind of cultural experience. For example, women maybe just are have a photo posted of them online and they could be shamed. There's even honor killings based on social media postings. And so when we think about governance too, we need to think about really radically different value systems and family commitments and things that, that here in the US I think people don't think about very often. Yeah, I think that added complexity of the fact that these rule sets that we're working within are created with one culture, they're applied to all sorts of other cultures. It really raises the question of whether it's possible to govern these spaces uh, from that U.S. point of view when they're when they're working in such radically different places. Um, so, Sharita Schoenbeck, it's been wonderful to have you with us today. Thanks for making some time for us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Mm -hmm.